Hello my quilting friends! My name is Leah Day and welcome to episode 25 of the podcast. This episode I'm going to be interviewing Laura Koya. She has a YouTube channel, So Very Easy, and we're going to talk about making videos and sharing cool projects, sewing and quilting, that she shares on her channel. So definitely be looking forward to the interview with Laura coming up soon. Now for some updates around the house. I have been continuing to work on James's puff quilt. And uh, just in case you haven't realized, we also have live videos on YouTube. So if you'd like to actually see what I'm holding and touching, definitely come and check out the videos on YouTube. Uh, this is not just an audio podcast, it's also available as video too. So come and check it out. And uh, I will share some photos in the show notes that's gonna be available on my blog, freemotionproject.com. So, I've been working on this puff quilt for several months and it's finally all together and all puffy and it's a super Mario mushroom with kind of a um, mosaic background. I've just done a kind of a patchwork background with lots of different colors, orange, blue, green, and gray. And I love it. It came out really, really good and it's super funky, however, I just realized that I made a mistake with it. As I was getting ready and I have my backing fabric all spread out on the table and I'm all the way ready to go with basting this quilt and getting it finished, I realized that I have a really bad situation. I actually cannot stitch along the edge of this quilt and that's the weak point. The outer edge of the puff quilt is weak and it needs to be bound securely and it can't go through the machine at this point and I can't stitch a nice smooth edge to it. So I debated a lot of different ideas. I mean, I have my backing here ready to go, but the simple fact of the matter is it's just not gonna work. So I'm going to sit here and rip out uh, the stitching that's holding the holes closed on the back and I'm going to remove all of the puffs all along the edge of the quilt. And it's annoying and I wish I'd realized this before I'd you know, puffed the whole edge, but I don't think it's gonna to take too much time to remove the batting. Uh, well, not batting, it's um, fiber fill. And then once the edge is completely empty, then I can run it through the machine, reinforce it with extra stitching. And I think I'm going to end up adding maybe a two and a half inch strip all the way around the edge of the quilt. And that will be, um, that will, that will kind of reinforce that edge and I'll probably make it thick and quilt it fairly, um, not fairly densely, but just I'll make it nice and puffy, but it will take the stress of like pulling on the quilt and tugging it around and I'll make sure to reinforce it so that I don't get anything weird happening to the puffs. Like I was already starting to notice some gaps in the stitching and some of the puffs were kind of popping apart and it just really wasn't working. So I think taking a little extra time, you know, this was really just an experiment project. I'm learning as I go with this one and, and having a lot of fun with it too. And even if it's gonna take a couple more evenings to set and just take out the stitching and remove the fiber fill, I think it's worth it to have a quilt that's going to end up lasting and working so much better in the end. So that's what I realized just now, like literally five minutes ago, because <laughs> I was thinking, oh, I'll baste the quilt while I'm talking through the introduction of the podcast. And then I realized that that edge is just totally not working. So I, I needed to make a change. And I'll probably sit down on the couch tonight and just sit and, and pop these apart and pull out the fiber fill. Unfortunately, it feels like it's actually harder to get the fiber fill out of the puffs than it is to stuff it full. So that's not really a fun thing to realize, but hey, you know, if you ever decide to make a puff quilt, now you know, don't puff the edges, make sure to add a little border or something that's not puffy. So that way you're not trying to stitch right next to a two inch thick little puffy thing. <laughs> it's just not gonna work. <laughs> All right, so that's that project. So another thing that I was working on this week, and this will be going up tomorrow, and that is a collaboration with Laura Koya. She sent me this block and I quilted it. And here's uh, a close-up image, and you can see an image of the quilt on the show notes on uh, freemotionproject.com. So basically she created this really free-form applique quilt, and it's really busy. It had lots of busy fabrics and stuff. 
And so I took one look at it and was like, well, let's just throw a whole bunch of quilting on top of it. <laughs> so I quilted this thing kind of to death and I love it. I mean, it added a lot of extra texture and it is slightly chaotic, but I really think it worked out great. So be looking forward to the collaboration and you'll be able to see uh, how to piece or applique the block from Laura. And then you'll also be able to learn how to quilt it from me. So two cool videos coming up uh, then tomorrow. As this is posted on Wednesday, it will be posted, the collaboration will be posted on Thursday. So something else that I've been working on this week is this small quilt, and it is actually really special. It is a hoop quilt. So Anne-Marie Chaney, uh, she is genxquilters.com. She's been sharing these hoop quilt pictures on Instagram, and I have been completely awestruck by them. They're so awesome, mostly because they're just so cheerful. Uh, and they're always in these big giant quilting hoops. And so this is an 18 inch quilting hoop. So the quilt block was created and I'm going to put it inside and trim it down and kind of glue it in place. And so that will be something that can hang on my wall. So I pieced this with blue and green and purple batiks. I had these scraps laying around the house and they've been kind of in a drawer for years. So it's really nice to be able to use up all of those fabrics in this project. And uh, I'll be sharing a collaboration of how I quilt this. I'll be quilting it on my home machine and I'll probably share that sometime in the middle of August. So definitely be looking forward to that. And you can see a picture, of course, of this quilt as well in the show notes. So I'm excited because I love the whole hoop quilt idea. It's just, I don't know, there's something about it that just makes me really smile because it's so cheerful, it's so simple, and then the hoop is such a nice frame to the whole quilt. You know, it'll hang on the wall and be just something I can, I can just kind of stick it anywhere. You know, all I need is a nail in the wall and I can hang it up and have an instantaneous uh, quilt right there in a corner. So that's really fun. Now, the last thing that I wanted to share was kind of update on my book. I have all the text finished and it's already gone to my editor. And so she's been working on that and the layout will get started in August. And so we already know that the book will hopefully be finished sometime in September. But the issue that has continued to be a thorn in my side is the photos. So I checked around with some local photographers and I called around and tried to get estimates. And the cheapest that we managed to find photography from a professional photographer in a studio was $2,500. And that is just beyond my budget when I also add in my editor and layout artist and everything else I've already paid for. Uh, and, you know, I just can't, I can't publish a book with it that far in the hole before we even sell one copy. And that's the thing with self-publishing is instead of the publisher taking on all of those costs, you know, kind of have to do it yourself and either pay someone else to do it or figure out how to do it yourself. So what we ultimately decided was we need to add photography to as one of the skills that I know how to do. And so I finally bought a good camera. I, I picked up a Nikon 3400. And so it's an entry level DSLR camera. I'm still just learning how to play with it, just taking some simple shots and stuff. And we actually installed a new place to shoot photography outside. So the yard is not pretty and uh, my house is not all that pretty either. And I looked at the walls and said, well, is there any place that I have big enough where I could maybe pen or hang the quilts on the wall outside and get nice natural light? and be able to shoot photos, you know, kind of edge to edge of the whole quilt at once. And I found one place and it's on the back of the house, thank goodness. <laughs> and we have screwed polystyrene boards to the back of the house. It does not look good, but you know what? You got to do what you got to do. And a long time ago, I decided that um, I didn't need a perfect house, but I did need a house that worked for my business. So that's what this is. So whenever I need to shoot, I'll go outside and cover this area with a big piece of fabric. I'll be able to set up a tripod and shoot as many photos as I need to. And I've kind of played around with the lighting in this area and figured out that uh, as long as it's after one o'clock in the afternoon, the sun has already passed over the back of the house and you get really nice diffuse natural light. So 
it's kind of win-win. I think this is going to end up working out okay. I uh, still need to learn more about taking the photos and, and editing the photos and all that good stuff. And I, I feel like I can take my time doing that and work on those photos and learn a lot as I'm finishing up this book. And then this is going to be a skill that once I know how to do it and I know what I'm doing, it's going to help me make more books and better videos and all that kind of stuff. It'll, it'll make the blog better. It'll make everything prettier. It'll make my Instagram prettier. So I think that'll be a good thing. It is frustrating. And I always kind of, whenever I get a new piece of equipment, I kind of go through a couple days of just like, oh, I don't want to learn something new and frustration. Uh, and with this in particular, I've just had to kind of take a step back and just go outside and play. So we were canning over the weekend and I shot some pictures and just had a fun time playing with the camera and seeing how, you know, really it makes beautiful shots without even really trying. So that makes me cautiously optimistic that I can do this myself. So, so that's pretty much it for the updates around the house. That's everything that I'm working on right now. Uh, our sponsor for the show is the Mega Pinwheel Star Walking Foot Workshop. This is a workshop where you will learn how to quilt with a walking foot and we're going to stitch three different designs and we quilt them on a large scale so you'll finish the quilting process really quickly. And it was a fairly large quilt that I made. Uh, the Mega Pinwheel Star is pretty big. It's like throw size and I put minky fabric on the back. And so that was a little bit challenging, but you know what? It quilted up beautifully and I shared lots of tips and tricks on machine quilting, moving the quilt, dealing with the common issues that can happen like pleats and puckers, whiskering, all that good stuff. So if you'd like to learn more about walking foot style quilting, definitely check out the Mega Star Walking Foot Workshop available at leahday.com. And now let's learn more about Laura Koya and her YouTube channel, So Very Easy. Hello, my quilting friends. Welcome to episode 25 of the podcast. My name is Leah Day, and today I'm here with Laura Koya, a fellow YouTuber. Welcome to the show, Laura. Hi, happy to be here. Now, a little introduction. Laura is a freelance educator, a pattern designer, and the founder of So Very Easy, which is a, her very active YouTube channel. Her videos are uploaded every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Her videos are easy to follow, allowing you to get the project done. She is a registered professional with over 45 years of sewing experience. If you've watched her videos, you will see her relaxed, it's all good attitude. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, what it's like to make videos and teach online. So let's start. Why did you want to make a YouTube channel and how did you get started? Yes, well, my son had years, for years had been telling me to start a channel, but, uh, well, you know, I have children and I had a life, so it just didn't really happen, and then one day, uh, another friend had said to me, you know, you should do this on YouTube, so I thought, what the heck, let's give it a try, so I did, and, and here I am. <laughs> Perfect, so how did you start your channel? What was your first video about? Oh, that's a good question. Um... I think I was doing a video on all of my tablecloth quilts. I love to eat on my quilts. So, <laughs> so it's, it's a quilt that's a tablecloth? That's like sacrilegious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can only have so many on your bed, and I want to enjoy them, so I make them for tablecloths. Awesome. So do you make them out of any specific special fabric or just regular quilting cotton? just like you do a normal quilt. But most times I don't put um, a batting inside. I'll just put a flannel or something, you know, that I can wash a lot. Cool. So yeah. that first video, can you describe what it was like to make that first video and what did you learn as you were going through the steps of making it? Well, I think I've learned more over in the last two years than I did from that very first video. But, um, the first video, I think what I did is I was trying to do too much, and it was kind of all over the place. So I've learned that you have to take the videos and get them a little bit more just that one subject matter. You know, I have a tendency to go on, so uh, that's what I've had to learn to do. Yep, condensing it down to just yeah. those specific points. I completely agree. 
So why do you call yourself a freelance YouTuber? Like, what, what do you mean by that? Well, um, I'm freelance because I don't work for anybody. I don't work for any company. Um, I, I just work for myself. So I can use any products that I want and any time I want. So I can use one fabric company one day and use another fabric another day. And there's no conflict because I don't work for anybody. I work for me. And I think that gives the viewers um, more, th more things to look at. I'm not just kind of putting myself into one pigeonhole. I have the whole world as anything that I can use. So as a freelance, I'm basically no different than if you're a freelance writer. I can freelance sew. <laughs> it's sort of this thing that I created. <laughs> I like it. No, and that's really makes a lot of sense. And I, I wouldn't have thought about it that way. And, you know, being a YouTuber and teaching sewing online, do you ever get kind of a weird reaction to that? Like, you know, you know, do people ask you if you teach in person too? Yes. Yeah. I'll, and it's funny because of course, nobody on YouTube, nobody knows where you're from, you know, unless they search for you. So, um, often if I met a show, then they'll say, Oh, well, can you teach in person too? Can you do trunk shows? Like, what else do you do? Wow, you're a real person. And then the other comment I get is, wow, you're a lot shorter than I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can fake a lot of things in a video. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really funny. We did some videos, my husband and I, and he's actually a little shorter than I am. And so people got used to seeing us kind of setting at the same height. And then when they met him in person, they were like, oh, like that was the number one comment. You're a lot shorter than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not always a nice thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so when you're teaching a, a video on YouTube, are you making something specific? Are you doing a pattern or like kind of what do you generally share? Like what's your thing every single week? Well, I try to do all different things. Because I'm doing sewing, I'm not just going to do quilting. I can do garments construction. I can even do repairs on garments. Like I, one video, I teach you how to fix your ripped belt loop that we always get on our jeans. You know, so it's not just quilting. And basically, what I want to sew is, is what I'm bringing to the viewers. So I often kind of will do it around seasonal things or if I have a special occasion in my life or I see a new fabric line that I get really excited about or maybe something just comes into my mind and I go oh I gotta share this right away and then I clear off my table and I start the next episode so so th that's how you pick it's just like whatever you feel like doing yeah most times <laughs> a lot of times though I try to keep it seasonally Cool. Yeah. So I'm, I'm comparing what I do and my system is usually like I work in series. Do you work in any series? Like uh, kind of have a part one, part two, part three published over several weeks or do you only do you put everything in one single video? Um, I, I try to put everything that I can in one video unless it's really something that's complicated. Believe it or not, I have a three part series on how to sew on buttons. <laughs> You wouldn't think that takes three parts. You no, know? and I thought I was going to do it in one video, but there were so many different types of buttons. And, you know, so I thought, well, I'm just going to break that down so that it's, you either have this style button or this style button. And that way, you know, I'm not rambling on through an entire video. If that's not what you're wanting, you're going to be able to get and just go right to that one particular thing. So, yeah, sometimes I kind of know they're going to be long, and then other times they kind of spring up on me. Yeah, and so what's your system? You, you have an idea, and then you start breaking it down to make the video. What's your process for that? I come up with an idea, and then I have to research the materials that I'm going to need, or I design the pattern. So, you know, usually it's I have this idea, I design the pattern, then I research what I'm going to need. Do I need fabric? Do I need interfacing? Um, is it going to be an actual pattern or what I'm going to do? So then I have to accumulate all of these things. So I have this little bookshelf with these totes in my room, and each of them has a project in them. So as the projects are finished, then I'm able just to take that tote and do a video. Perfect. So you make the entire thing... 
whatever it is, let's say, you know, it's like sewing on buttons, so maybe it's a shirt. So you make the entire shirt and then you break it into pieces to shoot the video? Is that how it works? Yeah, a lot of times it will be. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll be filming it just exactly as the way I would be making it. And then from there, I'm going to be able to edit it and put things in. You know, then I can do close-ups and talk more about one particular thing that might be, you know, challenging for, you know, for someone to do. And then I'll go on to the next stage. So you're following step by step so you can get the project done step by step. That makes sense. Yeah, I do it ever so slightly differently. Um, like with a quilt or something like that, I'll just shoot it in like little pieces and then bring it in and construct more and then, you know, kind of work it step by step because I don't want to end up with two quilts at the end of it. Do you ever struggle with that? Like having so many step outs created and then what to do with the step outs at the end? No, um, I really just, because I'm making, I usually only make one item. Unless I have an item that I'm going to show right at the beginning of the video, then um, I'm starting and finishing the entire project. So if I'm sitting on the machine, then I don't have the camera running because you don't need to see me sitting at a machine. So I just go step by step. Um, and I try not to have too many, too many, pro you know, that way I don't have too many projects. Because I have a lot, I do two a week, so that's a lot of, that's a lot of stuff at the end of the year. Yeah, that's a hundred and, what, a hundred and eight videos a year, so. Right, it's so a, it's a hundred, it can be, you know, almost a hundred projects that I will have in my hand afterwards, so. That's a lot of quilting, that's a lot of garment construction, so. I don't want to do more than one I don't want to do more than one shirt that looks exactly the same or one quilt that's the same. Exactly. So tell me about your quilt patterns. Uh, how do people get them? If, if you are sharing online on YouTube, do they go to your website in order to download the pattern? No, um, some patterns I do have free and some they're actually printed patterns so that you can go and print them out and follow along. But my main idea is to show you the step by step. So I give you enough directions, enough measurements that you don't need to print out the pattern. And the idea is that you can make it your way. So if you want to have it, you know, a twin size quilt, then you can make it that way. If you want to do a king size or if you just want to do a table runner. So it's more teaching you how to construct the block, how to put it together. And then from there, you can choose the sizes. So I've shot videos like that too, where I try and include all of the measurements and all of the instructions in the video, and I end up completely butchering it. How have you gotten good at listing off exact numbers? I make myself big notes and pieces of paper sitting on my Mr. Tripod so that I could look up and give the right numbers. But sometimes I do get excited, and then I you know, have, I, I do give the wrong measurements so that I'm always having to correct it afterwards. And I'll put a notation in the description, you know, like, got a little excited on this one. It's not three inches. It might be five inches. And then I might even say, okay, here, I've given you a handout, print it out, to follow along with the measurements. Yeah. 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 It's, it's always one of those challenging things. I've leaned more towards the printed pattern uh, just to, so I don't even have to think about listing the exact numbers, but I like your method. Like, you know, sometimes you just have to just say, Hey, I'm sorry. I, I, I made a mistake. Well, I'm human. Yeah. I, I, I like that. And it, it sounds like you're very laid back with how you publish this and how you share, you know, uh, what, what helps you maintain that kind of laid back chill attitude with all of your videos? I picture that I picture my girlfriends in my sewing room. I want my, I, the thing is, is whenever I was sewing with my friends, they would always, you know, you always ask each other for advice. Oh, I don't know how to do this, or how should this be done? And, oh, this is giving me a hard time. So I just kind of picture that instead of my camera being a camera, that it's my friends. And I think quilting should be relaxed. We don't need to sew nowadays. We don't need husbands to sew for anymore. We can sew because we want to sew. So it should be fun. We should not stress about it. Certainly. I completely agree. So someone just getting into quilting or sewing, what advice would you give them when they're first getting started? 
Well, the first thing would be go to your local quilt shop because they really are a wealth of information for you. They they have the experience, they have the tools that you need. You can take classes. And if you're stuck halfway through a project at home, you know, they're more than happy for you to bring the project in and say, hey, what am I doing? What do I need to do next? And, you know, just be relaxed about it. Have fun. We don't need to. It, it's a hobby, you know, so we should enjoy it. We shouldn't stress about it. So get help and figure out how to do it and then just go, go for it. Have fun. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to making your patterns and, and the different things that you share on YouTube, can people take those and, and make them and like sell them or give them away? Like, what do you what do you hope that people will take your tutorials and do? Well, first of all, yes, they can they can make them. And I have people that say, can I do this project and sell them at a craft show? Go for it. You know, I just would like them to let me know that they're doing it. And to give me credit for it, you know, that so that if they're going to be doing something, then at least I'm getting the credit for it. Um, but they're more than welcome to use them because I'm, I'm happy that they do it. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, and I think that that's, you know, it, that's very giving because ultimately if someone goes and shares it at a craft show, you know, that's more opportunity for other people to see your work or particularly if they're giving you credit and saying hey I learned this on YouTube from Laura you know and I think that's wonderful so do you do anything other than YouTube do you have a website that people can come and, and buy stuff from you no I don't um, I don't sell anything and that's where I'm able to stay as a freelancer because I'm not selling anything um, Eventually, I do want to carry my own line of patterns and stuff like that. But I'm just having a lot of fun doing YouTube right now, so I'm 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 happy with that. I do I do do a lot of teaching. I do trunk shows, so um, that kind of keeps me busy too. And I'm in the middle of trying to write a book. If I could just find an extra day, that day between Monday and and Tuesday, I think there must be a spare day somewhere that I'm missing. <laughs> you need an extra 24 hours, right? I do. <laughs> well, a uh, little piece of advice, get up an hour early every day. And by the end of the week, you've got, you've got seven extra hours right there. <laughs> well, keep that in mind. <laughs> so you don't have an online store. You don't sell things. So how do you get paid? How does this channel make money? Um, it's making money because of YouTube. YouTube actually pays me, which is kind of cool. Mind you, it's not a whole lot of money. I'm not going to retire with this. Uh, if you knew how much I would be making, you'd be telling me to go get a real job. But uh, So I do get paid by YouTube. Um, basically, the commercials that you watch, you know, they go to, they pay YouTube. YouTube, in turn, pays me. So that's sort of how it works. Um, so the more you watch the commercial, the better for me. The more you share my videos, the more, the longer you watch the videos. Um, all of these things, all the interaction makes it better for me. And then I do have sometimes every once in a while, you know, I get the extra money from teaching and doing trunk shows. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So it's mostly ad revenue is, is kind right. of your number one thing. And do you use anything extra on YouTube to uh, help you know how to make a video more successful? So, like, you know, to help you with titling and tags and all that kind of stuff? Well, there are lots of different things you can do. Um, as a general rule, I kind of just do what I kind of feel people would want to look for or kind of search for, and then I go from there. And sometimes I can change the title if I find people aren't understanding what I'm trying to get across. But um, I don't usually focus too much on going into the analytics. I just, I just kind of figure this is what people want, and I'm hoping for the best. Yeah, I find that if I focus on that stuff too much, it starts making me a little crazy. I'm like, I just want to teach quilting. I don't want to be an expert. <laughs> you know, exactly. like all of the nuances, like if you ever go into the back end of YouTube, it's so complicated. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, sometimes it's just like, I'd, I'd rather be a professional quilter and just do that and not have to worry about all that complication. So uh, talking about how, how long does it take you to make your average video. So you have one coming up every Tuesday and every Thursday. And so it's like 108 a year. So about how long do you spend working on each one? Um, 
each video will take me anywhere between, I would, honestly, you're looking at almost two days of video. Because I have to take into account the time that I have to design it, think about it, collect all the materials, you know, and that's even before I turn the camera on. And then once I've turned the camera on, I have to make the items. So if it's taken me eight hours to make a quilt, that's still part of it. Then I have to go and edit it. Then I have to get it up on YouTube. So it can be anywhere between a day, two days, sometimes even three days. And do you have anyone helping you filming or editing your videos? Me and me. <laughs> One person of many hats. <laughs> <laughs> that just kind of makes it, so, well, I'm in full control. So I kind of know, especially if I go to edit, I already knew what I said. So I kind of can go from there. That makes total sense. Yeah, my husband will oftentimes edit for me, and I've started keeping him notes because it's like, I butchered that ending. Use the last one. <laughs> you know? Exactly. It yeah. really does speed up the process because he doesn't, he can't, he's not out there with me, so he doesn't know that I had a terrible time filming that day. He just has to sit there and wade through 10 hours of footage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it is painful whenever that happens. Yeah. So do you ever run out of ideas? Like, how do you continually replenish your um, inspiration for new projects? You know, it's the funniest thing is when I'm making one video, I usually come up with another one right in the middle as I'm making the video. Sometimes it just, I might see a technique uh, that I could have done in a different way. So that sort of gets my mind going on another project or something else. And yeah, sometimes I'll make one project and I have leftover fabric. So then I think, well, I have to do something with this, you know, and then just looking at anything around me inspires me. Absolutely. So I, I've never run out of ideas. The problem is, is I keep getting more than I'm making. It's like, where's the time? <laughs> yeah, my pile keeps getting bigger. It should be getting smaller, but it's not. So what do you do with your projects after they're finished? So, you know, like it's a shirt, you obviously, you know, probably take it and wear it, right? Uh, you know, quilts and stuff. Do you ever find yourself just running out of space? Yes. <laughs> But I have, I have friends who really like me. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if I'm going to sew for um, like a little boy's outfit, I just make sure it's going to fit my grandson. Aww. Or if, so if I'm going to do something, I try to make it so I know where it can go afterwards. Makes you sense. Know, you, you can really only have so many. Exactly. And I'm having that trouble too. It's like, okay, closets are filled with quilts. I don't need any more quilt tops to the bed. Now they're all gifts. It's like, who in the family hasn't gotten a quilt this year? <laughs> yes. Ooh, a list of boyfriends and girlfriends and, yeah. And that's why I eat on them. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> you can that, afford to eat I can, on them. I can enjoy them. <laughs> exactly. So uh, let's talk about the nitty gritty of, of filming, uh, if you don't mind. Like, uh, what camera do you use? How do you set up your shots uh, and lighting? All that kind of good stuff. Because I'm sure that's a, that's a struggle for a lot of people when they're first getting started. Lighting is especially hard. Um, to start with, I have an XA30 Canon camera, uh, which is a really nice camera. It just gives me a good focus. I can get really close up and it doesn't blur out on me, which is really good. Uh, tripod sits in my room and I have 22 lights. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 22 lights. Because depending on the time of day, I might have to change my lighting. And even then, sometimes, no matter what I do, it is what it is. So it might not be the lighting that I want, but... Uh, other than 22 lights, I'm cooking in there, so I have to leave it at 22 lights. And besides, I'm running out of room. I can't get any more in the room. Exactly. You're probably stumbling over all of it. So do you mount your cameras on tripods? Is that how you set them up, or do you have it like permanent mounts, like stuff screwed to the wall? No, I have them in. Everything is portable, so I have my tripod. Uh, it's a great tripod because I can get it in multiple different positions, so I can get the angles that I want. And that way I can also change it. So if I want to go to another view, I have a design wall that when I'm filming, I'm looking at it. So it would be the back of the camera. 
so that I can turn the camera around to the other side so that you can see it on the design wall. That makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is just different for everybody. I set mine up permanently, like uh, mount the tripods to the wall, but they're okay. harder to find. And oftentimes, like I use security camera tripods and stuff like that. And they're hard to find and they're usually not very well built because it's very unusual. I mean, normally people don't want to mount a camera permanently to a wall. So I completely understand how you've got that set up. So if somebody else was interested in starting a channel and they're just getting started today, what advice would you give them? Well, you really have to start with good equipment. You know, that's the first thing, because if not, you're only going to get frustrated with the final results and... When you're getting frustrated, then it's not going to be enjoyable to do. So it's got to stay enjoyable. Um, I think the other thing is, is you need to be passionate about what you want to start and what you want to do. You know, just because you might think that this is going to be something that people want to see, if you're not really passionate about it, I, I don't think you will enjoy it as much. And I think it's very important for you to enjoy what you're doing. So I think that's the other thing that's really important. Um, and you know what? Practice. And over time, it's going to get better. Like if you look at my first videos, and please don't, they're terrible. <laughs> you get better over time. Oh, you know, yes. Because you get more relaxed. You understand how to work the camera equipment. And uh, then from there, it's just a lot more fun. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, and I'm the same boat. Don't go back and look at my first videos. They're awful. So yeah. I completely agree. So um, what... You know, as far as sewing, going back to kind of where you started sewing and quilting, you said that you've had quite a lot of experience. When did you get started sewing? And uh, have you ever, like, taught that in, you know, school, anything like that? Yeah, I started sewing, as a lot of people did, right by my mother's knee. Um, so I sat on boxes, and my mother taught me to sew, and I went from there. I never did stop sewing. Um, even though, you know, as kids, we kind of like doing it because it's like hobby. I never did. I just kept going. I kept going. I bought my first sewing machine when I was probably about, you know, in grade six. Nice. By high school, I was already designing and making my own clothing. And my first jobs actually were sewing related. So I did that. I worked in um, leather factories. I worked in other sewing places. I've worked in a tailor shop. I've worked in, I've worked all over for the sewing industry, but my first love was um, garment making, and then from there it went into quilting, so I never did stop when I started very, very young, which I don't even remember how young, I just don't ever remember not sewing, you know, so I've, I've, I've always been in it, I've always been in it, it's just, it's just part of who I am and what I think, so... Absolutely. So other than sewing and quilting, do you have any other hobbies? Does that include any other kind of needlework? <laughs> no, you have to list them all separately. <laughs> <laughs> so we have knitting and cross stitching and all of those types of needlework. But I love to entertain. Oh. Yeah, I love to entertain. And I also love a good book. Yes. I love to curl up and get lost in a good book. Wonderful. Yeah. So why haven't you shared videos on knitting? Well, the, my channel is so very easy. So <laughs> I try to keep them as close to sewing as possible. So, you know, sewing into that, anything in the sewing hobby thing. And knitting would be a whole new thing for me to start. So... Maybe, yeah. maybe just kind of like a, every, every once in a while, like, hey, we're, we're going to zing it up with a little bit of knitting. It just might be something fun to just kind of share whatever you're knitting right now. Well, I, I do have a f fun thing coming up now that you mention it, which actually nobody knows. So I guess I'll let you know. <laughs> I'm going to start going live. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I'm going to be doing no sew kids crafts. I'm going to try for a couple of times and see how it works out because it's summer. I think it would be nice for the kids to be able to do stuff and the grandparents and moms and dads can do the crafts with the kids. So there are going to be no sewing projects. So a whole lot of hot glue, right? Yeah, hot glue and stickers and fun things. So what? I'll see how that goes. I'm going to try it for a while. So that should change things up a bit. 
Yeah. So whenever you try something new like this, how much time, how many videos do you commit to? Uh, this one I'm going to commit to four videos. Um, I already have that in my mind to do. Uh, then we'll see from there how it goes because I've never done this before. So, you know, I don't want to say to people, oh, I'm going to be doing this for six months. And then, you know, it's not, people are not enjoying it. I think it's important that they're enjoying it. So I'm going to start with four and go from there. Absolutely. So of all of the videos you've made, and you've been doing this a while, two videos a week, uh, what would be your favorite? The favorite videos that you've done so far? Oh, man, that can be a really loaded question. Usually the video you're working on is usually the, the project you like the best at that time. But when I look back, I do really, I did enjoy, I did the Canadian quilt that was a four-part follow-along. And um, I had a lot of fun doing that because I had a lot of interaction. A lot of people are making it. And not just Canadians. A lot of people all over the world are making it, which is really fun to see all the different color variations. So that was a really fun project. Um, a lot of crafts have been fun. I made this black and white quilt with this really bright green in it. And it was a lot of fun to make. It was with jelly rolls. It was a jelly roll race. I just sort of changed it a bit. That was another fun one. So, yeah. But usually it's the one I'm working on. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I have one last question to ask, and that is what are you most looking forward to in the next five years? That can be your YouTube channel, personal, and whatever you feel like sharing. Just what are you most excited about and looking forward to in the next five years? Wow, that's a good one. You know what? I just am looking forward to see where this takes me. I just, you know, I get to answer all of these comments from people all over the world. And it's it's like I have this friends all over the world now. And it's very exciting to answer them. It's very exciting to see what people are going to say. Because a lot of times it might not even be about the project I'm making. They start to, uh, you know, want to know about the kids or what I'm doing. And so it's it'll be very interesting to see where this takes me because... There's just so many possibilities. And, you know, and I, I still, like I said, I still want to find that extra day to be writing. So hopefully I can squeeze that in and all of everything else. Well, like I said, all you got to do is wake up an hour earlier. You got seven extra hours there. <laughs> Every I'm day in the, the sewing room sewing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. Let everybody know where they can find you online on YouTube. Uh, you just go to YouTube and type in so very easy with an S E W and um, and I pop right up. It's Laura from So Very Easy. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Lee. It's always nice talking to you. Have a great day. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to find more episodes of the Hello My Quilting Friends podcast, check it out at Leahday.com slash podcast. We have a player that will play through all of the episodes shared so far, so you can binge listen for hours on end. Until next time, let's go quilt.